Hey, welcome in. Welcome to the Arrowhead Attic Podcast. We are here coming to you live. The Kansas City Chiefs are going to the Super Bowl. You only win a you only win a Super Bowl two times every five years, right? Oh! The warm-up act is over. Let's bring in Melissa Etheridge, massive Chiefs fan. Melissa, Super Bowl champion, two-time Pro Bowler, and Trent Green. Trent Green, how you hey, doing? Hey, hey, what's going on, guys? And oh, wow. oh, he picked it up! He picked it up! He's gonna score! We'll see you next week. But until then, as always, go Chiefs. Welcome. This is Wacky Wednesday on the Arrowheaded Attic channel. I'm Adam Best here with Sterling Holmes and producer Richard. You know what I noticed this time with that intro? Patrick says something like, you only win a Super Bowl two out of every five years. That's no longer true. It's outdated. We need a new... A sound clip for that for that intro. It's three every five years. It's a good call. It's a good call. And also I'm a little bummed. Uh, we need more of Patrick jumping in pools. Little little mm. lame that he's no no longer jumping in pools for Super Bowl victories. Also, did that tattoo ever happen? I thought it did, but it's been pretty quiet. You know, he's supposed to get a tattoo for the Chiefs winning, and I haven't seen it. We need to make sure. That that isn't temporary. There needs to be an investigation here, I think. An Arrowhead Addict investigation into the tattoo promise of, of Patrick Allen. Yeah, I mean, come on now. You, we can't let him go slipping it and sliding around a legitimate bet like a tattoo. I don't care where, it, where it's put. Tattoo has to be shown and it has to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, hey, he's, he's traditionally a man of his word, so... He said it. I'm expecting it to eventually happen. But, you know, there might be a little bit of weaseling right now. <laughs> Maybe just a little bit. Well, we've got an awesome show for you guys today. Going to ask some burning questions that have popped up during what I think is a pretty eventful offseason to, to date so far. Yeah, and before we do that, just want to let everyone know, if you've not downloaded the FanDuel app yet, you will definitely want to take advantage of this offer. New users who sign up through our link must deposit $10 and place a first wager of $5 on any live bet. If that first bet wins, you will receive $200 in bonus bets straight to your account. This offer is only available if you sign up through our link, bit.ly forward slash arrow 200. You can find that link in the description below our stream, as well as scan the QR code, uh, QR code on screen to start signing up. Again, the link is bit.ly forward slash arrow 200. Offer is only available to new customers with 21 plus and physically present in legal gambling states. Please remember to always gamble responsibly. Check the episode description for the link and the full terms of the offer. Man. You broke through that with the speed of Tyreek Hill. I don't know, I'm slowing down, man. I'm, I'm, you are. I, feel, I, feel, I feel like I'm getting old when it comes to this now. I feel like I'm I'm, I'm washed up in my fast-talking uh, speed game. I know what's happened. We used to have a training camp battle between you and Vertoram. Yeah, I kicked his and, ass. It and, was and a competition. But that was pushing you a little bit, maybe. Well, it was Tyreek Hill versus, I don't know, Donovan Smith running a 40-yard dash. I mean, it wasn't really that, that much of a competition. Healthy Donovan Smith or, or injured Donovan Smith? I'll give him healthy. Uh, Vertoram okay. was better okay. than I expected doing the speed challenge, but I mean, come on now. As I mentioned previously, we have our 10 burning questions today, and we're bringing back an old friend, the Countdown Otron 8008, to help us out with that. We're going to do four minutes per answer. I think this is, is going to be pretty fun. It's a smorgasbord of rules and free agency and looking ahead to the draft and uh, kind of just a fun, goofy question at the end that I'm, I'm curious about. So uh, let's get it kicked off. Number one, how will the new hybrid kickoff change how special teams coach Dave Tobe approaches his unit? Yeah, we, we've always have been used to Tobe's guys, right? Dave Tobe has always had a, a choice of at least a couple guys on the end of the roster. Now, how many guys will he get now? Does he get even extra say in regards to special teamers. Cause I do think there's something to be said about how uh, now that bottom seven players, whatever it was in the past, it becomes even more important. And Dave Tobe is a hell of a special teams coach. I am excited for this. I originally, I thought, okay, only teams who are bad offensively, they improve the most. Well, I think if you have the best 
and most exciting and most out there special team head coach, you actually have, I think, a larger advantage. So I think Dave Tobin, the Chiefs, for example, here, actually might have a leg up on the competition. Um, yes, I am very excited to see how Dave Tobin will handle this. Don't know if it's going to be one guy back there, two guys back there, some end arounds, some specialty stuff, because you can go up to two guys back there in the return area, which is goal line to 20. Um, the landing zone, right? The landing zone. Uh, is Justin Reed going to be kicking off at any point? I, I laughed and said, you know what, though? If it's a close game, game on the line, you know they have to return it. Do you want Butker down there or do you want Reed down there? Pop-up kicks no longer matter. Who cares about the hang time? Because no mm -hmm. one can move until the dude touches it. So you know what that means? Justin Reed. You don't have to be quite as particular on how you get the ball, what yard line it lands on. Just get it down there and lay someone out. So Dave Toe. Here's to you, guy. I think this will potentially revitalize a player. We will get to him in the, in the next question. Dave Tobe, his kind of Achilles heel has been being too aggressive on punt returns. I think that aggression actually pays off here. I think that creativity actually pays off here. Andy Reid as well, because now there's going to be more spacing, and it's almost going to be like run fits or, or like jet sweep kind of kind of plays that you're going to see down there. And I think because there's less of a risk of injury now, you're going to see higher caliber um, players down there, especially at uh, times where uh, big games are on the line. I don't know if they're going to use Isaiah Pacheco back there. They might be trying to limit his, his touches. Canadius Tony, we will get to, but it's going to be interesting to say the least. I think uh, in terms of who is blocking and who is tackling, this might put more of a premium on a guy like Noah Gray, who can really move for an athletic offensive lineman who uh, is good in space. Uh, linebackers, I think, if you're trying to be the 53rd guy and you're really good at, at you know tackling in the kickoff game, the past few years, kickoffs have been non-existent. Last year, it was the worst kickoff return year we've seen. And you're seeing more injuries, more touchbacks. It's gotten to the point where it's just ceremonial, where they might as well, if they didn't do this, I was to the point where I, where I said, just put the ball in the 20 or 25 and let's get started. But this actually infuses some purpose and some excitement back into something that was just ceremonial and kind of pointless. I mean, the restroom break for me was basically, oh, kickoff's coming up. I'm going to go, I'm going to go to the John and come back. Yeah, I mean, no longer can I leave to pour my glass of bourbon. Now I got to hustle, you know. It's making me run up there, getting me in shape. Thanks, guys. But again, I, I think this benefits teams like the Chiefs, teams that have a, a very good special teams coach and Dave Toe back there. I think a team to watch as well. I know no longer is Bill Belichick down there, but I wonder how the Patriots end up handling special team units because they're always – uh, are seemingly thinking outside of the box. I'm happy about this. I, I, I'm excited to see where we go with this next one because I have some more thoughts on uh, on question number two. One more team to watch for, Mike McDaniel and the speedy Miami Dolphins. That will be fun. Touchdown, Kansas City! Number two, should Kadarius Tony become exclusively a return specialist given how the importance of the kickoff game has increased? No, he should be used exclusively as a SoundCloud rapper. I'm I'm over it, dude. I'm done with this. I'm sorry, man. Juice ain't worth the squeeze. It's just not. And by the way, do you trust Tony as a return man? I sure don't. Especially with these convoluted rules now. I definitely don't. I, I actually don't think you want a speedster necessarily back there, which I know is going to sound crazy. I think you want more of a running back type, which is why I think the Steelers did a great job with uh, getting Cordell Patterson. You got a guy who's wide receiver running back and has great vision. I think vision makes way more sense in this instance than just top end speed. Athleticism, of course, sure, that's always going to be a plus, but you want someone who can follow your blockers because it's no longer just you have – all these guys running down, you have time, just get out as quick as possible. Now it's a little bit of wait and see. Do you trust Kadarius Tony to do a little bit of wait and see, use his vision? Again, we know the athleticism is there, but it's between the ears, man. I I, I don't know. Um, my gut tells me no. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, another team can take a chance on him, but at, at some point, um, 
you got to move on. And I think it's, it's time to move on. You say that, but we know Andy Reed is, is stubborn when it comes to loyalty. He sticks with guys. He gives them opportunities when a lot of times the fan base thinks that this guy needs to be jettisoned like CEH last year. He was not jettisoned. He was on the roster. He played an important role. And I know you're going to say like, it's a little bit different because, yeah. because you have some character concerns, but I disagree with you on Kadarius Tony. I think he has great vision. I think he follows his blockers. Well, I think he has instinct that cannot be taught. We saw that in the Super Bowl against the Eagles. We've seen that at other times you put him in the backfield and he is a, he is a hard nosed runner with good instincts that follows his, his blocks and is very shifty. He can hit a hole. I think he's got, you know, he's just got a good feel and good vision. Uh, I think it would be perfect to put him back there, totally offload the offensive responsibilities, which seem to be too much of a burden for him. He, he just doesn't have the capacity to, to pick up the nuances and, and kind of the, the, the technical jargon, I guess, of, of the wide receiver position. It just does not, He's not a fit there. He cannot run the full route tree, cannot learn the playbook, and disappoints you at the most opportune times. But if you simplify him down to like an instinctual runner and just give him a few things on his playbook, turn him into basically Dante Hall, I think he might have a comeback in him. Yes, go ahead and put Kadarius Tony and Sky Moore back there and see what happens. I mean, Sky Moore is a totally different. <laughs> Sky Moore is a totally different issue because Sky Moore didn't have any experience returning punts when he came to the NFL. Kadarius Tony has tons of experience with this kind of thing. Sure. I, again, comparatively, again, my my my. If I had my druthers, I say they move on. I know the Chiefs save nothing, but I'm just saying move on from KT and no hopefully. trade value either. No, of course not. I hope he lands somewhere else and he has a lot of success, but I, I just don't think it's going to happen here in Kansas City. I think a, a guy that I would I would love to see in a Chiefs uniform doing this is Jamal Agnew. Jamal Agnew seems to make a lot of sense. Former Jag, um, I, I feel like his role would be uh, perfect in this situation. Again, if you want Tony back there, I, I, I'm not going to necessarily argue too much. If, if he is going to be on the roster, I just – Hey, Not enamored by it anymore. There's no money saved. I'm just trying to see what we can do with the spare part because before this rule was announced, I thought he was pretty worthless. This might be a chance to revive uh, a depreciating asset. Touchdown, Kansas City! Number three, did the Chiefs lose out on some value in LeJarrius Sneed's trade market because the front office and ownership telegraphed that they would not pay Sneed? Oh, yeah, 100%. I mean, I, I never thought his trade value was going to be what I think the majority of Chiefs fans thought. Who said third rounder was the majority or the likely outcome of this? Yeah, it was, it was me. Again, yeah, but, but I, this I, year, this year, right? I agree, yes. And, and I said I wouldn't have traded him mm. for a third rounder. I would have kept him. I, I said this was the most likely outcome. Um, but yes, they, they lost out because they, you're right, telegraphed that, hey, we're not paying this guy. Well, when you do that, and all of a sudden, other teams around the NFL are finding other cheaper corners. Well, you don't have a lot of teams left. So when it comes to the Colts, the Colts are like, well, we know you're not going to pay them. We know you're not going to keep them. Here is what you're getting. Either you take it or you get nothing. And then you get the compensatory pick, which again is what I would have personally done. But that's neither here nor there. The Colts knew what they were dealing with at that point. They were basically the last bidder. And you don't want to bid against yourself. They called the Chiefs bluff. Chiefs tried to say, hey, no, 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 we're, we're kidding. We'll keep him on the franchise tag. And the Colts go, really? How about we throw a swap in there? And the Chiefs said, fine, we'll do it. I'm happy for Legereus. He got absolutely paid. I'm happy the Chiefs didn't give Legereus Sneed this particular contract. Look at the list of cornerbacks at, at, at age 28, 29, 30 when he's getting paid. And then look at the production and when it falls off. You, 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 you are not getting his best years, and you're paying for the best years. The Chiefs already got his best years, in my opinion. Love LeJarrius Sneed. I would have actually liked him playing on the franchise tag because you're probably getting one more great year of him. But that is a risky proposition. Chiefs were kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place, and they did not, in my opinion, position this as well as they could have. It's unfortunate how it played out. That Carlton Davis trade to the Lions immediately took a potential partner off the table, and for it to be... Chris Ballard at the end, someone who used to be in the Chiefs building and knows Brett Beach very well. 
you know, kind of playing poker with Brett Veach at the end, that was kind of a disaster. Uh, and it, it really came down to the Titans being the only realistic suitor, I think. Um, and there are two problems here. One, I think Clark Hunt. You know, he has a cash budget, and I think it was pretty obvious when he paid Chris Jones that LeJarius Sneed was gone. The other thing is, and I, I happen to agree with this philosophy, the Chiefs have found a competitive advantage. They evaluate, draft, develop, find cheap defensive back talent better than anybody in the league. And keeping the secondary cost down allows them to have two of the biggest contracts in the league in Chris Jones and Patrick Mahomes. It, it allows them to do to do a lot of things. I mean, LeJarius Sneed's contract uh, franchise tag this year was more than Tranquil, Mike Edwards, Donovan Smith, and Charles Aminahue put together last year quite easily, their, their cap hit. So this allows them to do some other stuff. And, and their history is just that they do this. So other teams knew it. You know, if you're not going to keep the Honey Badger and Traverius Ward and Kendall Fuller and Marcus Peters and Juan Thornhill, they know what's coming down the pike. It's obvious. So the Chiefs were kind of stuck bluffing when nobody fell for the bluff. And I, I, I kind of heard that they went to Indianapolis in the combine and they were pretty honest about moving on from Snead. They could have probably played it a little bit more coy. The other thing that needs to be considered here is LeJerry Sneed is a two-time Super Bowl champion. He was a linchpin on these teams, beloved in the locker room. You hear Andy Reid just gush about him as a human being. I do think they wanted to do right by Legereus sure. and make sure he got paid. Uh, by the way, Gary says, like in the sale of a home, if your market doesn't reflect your value, you wait a year, use his talent another year, pay him his money. And by the way, if you guys want to buy a home or sell a home, I slang real estate as well, baby. <laughs> there, there you go. Impromptu advertising. <laughs> well, I, I, come on. I was, I was, I just thought it was perfect real estate wise. It, you know? it um, is. But, but I think you're completely right. Let's move on to number four. Bring back Donovan Smith or sign a different free agent left tackle like Mackay Becton, Charles Leno, DJ Humphreys, or David Bakhtiari. Gosh, that's like a mash unit right there. Just the walking wounded. All four of those guys have significant health red flags. But there's some, some good players, some good projects in there. I like Charles Leno a lot. Is he going to retire. He's got this hip thing going on. We don't know. DJ Humphreys is probably out a similar, you know, he's got a similar timetable to Charles Aminahue, I'd say. David Bakhtiari, that guy hardly ever plays. I'd be the most out on him. And Mackay Becton, that is a Brett Feach uh, special if I've ever seen one. He loves failed former first rounders taking kind of cheap flyers on them. Ah, I like offensive line continuity. So I think even though some of these guys on paper are more talented than Donovan Smith, the fact that he has gotten through a postseason protecting Patrick Mahomes' blind side, they won a Super Bowl. I just think that continuity is important. Uh, I don't love it, but I'm sticking with Donovan Smith. Yeah, I think that's the right call. I don't think it's the sexy move. It doesn't have the upside of a David Bakhtiari, a guy who's been a all-pro who's – been phenomenal in the past, but again, we're talking about the past. We're trying to look ahead towards the future. Donovan Smith, I, again, you, you're right. They know what they have in him. Is it great? No. Is it solid? Yeah, I think it's solid. And again, if he misses a couple of games, I've said, and I think the Chiefs probably feel the same way, they trust Wanye Morris in a pinch. And so that's the way you roll with this. It, it allows Wanye to grow, it, and it also allows, to an extent, you know it's not going to be a large contract if Wanye Morris all of a sudden beats out Smith in, in, in training camp and OTAs in the preseason. Well, you're not sitting here going, well, we gave a large contract to a left tackle, to a veteran. Now we probably have to pay or play this guy because he's getting paid. You don't have to do that with Donovan. I, I don't think Donovan would be upset by that. I don't know the, the dude uh, you know, super, super well, but – that's the way I view this. Um, Tyron Smith was the dream until you saw the contract one year up to 20 with the Jets. That was absurd. That's asinine. That was twice as much as I think the majority of people thought he was going to get paid. Good for Tyron Smith, mm -hmm. but he's kind of the same thing as David back to the again with the great when he's healthy, but when is he healthy? You know, um, I think Donovan Smith is the answer. It's the right answer. It's the boring answer. But sometimes the boring answer is the correct move to make. Be boring. Boring can help bring you home a Lombardi. 
I think since he's already entrenched in our culture, it's easier to give the starting job to Wanye Morris or to even draft somebody and, and not kind of uh, cause bad vibes. You bring in Makai Becton or Charles Leno, one of these guys, they're going to want to be the presumed starter. That's just how it's going to be. Uh, they've they've all been starters at left tackle throughout their career. I just think that would be their expectation. Uh, and, and I think the Chiefs drafting an offensive tackle should be on the table early. If, if this is a, I mean, this is a great offensive tackle class. And sometimes you have to go where the depth is. And with Donovan Smith not back and Wanya Morris not a sure thing, and he, hell, even Juwan Taylor not a sure thing at this point. I think adding another tackle into the mix wouldn't be a bad idea. Yeah, I'm actually a massive fan of Mackay Beckton when he was coming out of Louisville. I just thought the size was spectacular as well as the athleticism combo. Uh, he's 6'7", 263. He's almost 25. 263? Uh, th sorry, 363. He slimmed uh, down a little bit, yeah, no, I was no, going to say. I apologize, 363. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's a huge dude. He was drafted 11th overall. I was very high on him. Not lived up to that by any means. Um, Get him with Andy Heck and Andy Reid. I could be intrigued. Touchdown, Kansas City! One quick caveat there. If they save on Donovan Smith and he's cheaper than these other options, I want them to spend that Legere Sneed money somewhere. Which I saw a question in the chat. When does it go through? We're still waiting. You know, Over the Cap does not have that yet. Well, if you look at Spot Track and you kind of dive down into some of the numbers, they have it in there. You're looking at 26.3 million, I believe, is why I was doing this today. 26.3 million uh, was the salary cap space the Chiefs have for their 53 um, or top 51, I think is actually what it was. This is before they have to pay for the rookie class, which is about what, $4.5 million or so. That's kind of the, the going rate with based on the, the Chiefs' current pick right now so then you're back down about 21 ish million dollars is what you have to work with um you have a, what four million or so for just operating costs just in general probably 16 or so million is probably what you're looking around that the chiefs have just to uh to really use and again that's about the amount that they spent on a minihue tranquil edwards and smith last year so i think they're going to bring in starters or uh, contributors with that money. I, I don't know that they're going to do anything splashy. Yeah. All right, let's get to the next one. Will the Chiefs move Chamari Connor into the slot role more given what he was projected to be by how much of the draft industri industrial complex? Industrial complex. Wow, dude. Wow, I can't read. For a guy that reads books, man, am I dumb. Hey, give yourself some grace here. It's... uh it's wow. Wednesday. It's hump day. Dude, uh, that I, was... <clears throat> I think uh, I'm going to say yes here. I'm a huge Shamari Connor fan. Uh, might as well be president of his fan club. I think the Chiefs like to have kind of that hybrid player who is sort of half safety, half slot. Remember, Tyron Matthew played in the slot a shit ton. And LeJarius Steed, what did he play in college? He was a safety. So they like guys that can do all this. And if you remember when Shamari Connor came out, the Daniel Jeremiah's of the world were calling him a slot corner, a slot player. That was kind of uh, the bill on him coming out. And he also played quite a bit in the slot during last preseason. Now, Brian Cook's injury kind of necessitated him being a safety. And uh, I don't think anybody could have anticipated that the Chiefs had two guys playing like top five corners at once. Basically, there was no need, especially with Watson and Williams kind of holding their own, there was no need to experiment with him in the slot. But I think part of this move, to me, shows how much faith they have in Chamari Connor as kind of the next great developmental defensive back project of the Chiefs. The issue is, in my opinion the speed he he runs you know with legerius the reason why he was able to move from safety to corners because he ran like a four three something mm -hmm. jamari ran a four five something now again i don't think the 40 time i I'm, I'm using almost my own thing against me here but i'm not a big fan of the combine i think the 40 yard dash is one of the most if not the most overrated um metric when it comes to how good is a player i think i think it's it's very silly 
I just don't know if he has the speed to necessarily move from safety to corner. That was my thought process of him coming out. But again, we've been proved prove wrong time and time again with what Shamari Connor has been. Again, the Chiefs pretty much thought he was going to be a special teamer. Well, he's already exceeded those expectations. I mean, he was really, really good, really solid last year. The one question I have is not can he do it. It's do you move Trent McDuffie primarily out of the slot to the outside? Because he's an all-pro slot corner. McDuffie is all-pro slot. I get it. Do you use a first-round draft pick on a slot corner? Maybe not. But in today's NFL, with slot receivers being so valuable, you got to find somebody who can shut those guys down, and Trent McDuffie does. You know, I don't know if, if Trent McDuffie is an all-pro corner if he moves to the outside. Maybe he's just above average. Maybe he's elite. Maybe we, we, we won't know until he does it predominantly out there. But at some point, I'm sitting here going, is the move from Chamari from safety, which, again, the Chiefs love to run three safety sets. They do. So you you got to find that out as well. If you move him to, to the slot and then move Trent to the out, to the outside, how, how much of a drop off from safety and how much of a drop off from the slot corner of Trent McDuffie's abilities to the outside takes place as well? I, I think there's a lot of moving parts. I wouldn't hate at least feeling it out, but I have a lot more questions than just plug and place. I think there's a lot more nuance to this. We were having the exact same conversation about LeJarrius Sneed a year ago, and he ended up traveling with number ones. And I think Trent McDuffie, he uh, in some ways – has better quickness and those kind of traits than Legereus Need. He doesn't have the straightforward track speed as Legereus Need, but I think he could he could maybe be an outside corner that could shadow some of these alpha receivers. The other thing here is a lot of the best players still in the market, free agent wise, are safeties. So if you play Chamari Connor more at slot corner, maybe you can make room for a Justin Simmons or a, a Blackman or Touchdown! someone like that. Kansas City. Number six, since I just brought him up, everyone talks about adding Justin Simmons, but is Isaiah Simmons, a freak of nature, formerly picked in the top 10, the better fit for the Chiefs? It's a good question. Seems like something Veach would like to do, former yeah. first rounder and the local ties, obviously. Um, it's good. It's tough. I, I don't know his role. Like, they've tried him as a linebacker. They've tried him as a safety. They've tried him in the Jamal Adams role, the combo. They've tried him, I believe he's lined up at a corner before, and he's also lined up as an edge rusher before. They have tried everything with Isaiah Simmons, but where does he actually fit? Now, I will say, doesn't that seem like something that, you know, Steve Spagnuolo would like to have in his back pocket, a jack-of-all-trades? But it almost feels like a jack-of-all-trades is a master of none. Right, it almost feels like he tries to do everything, but what is he actually good at? I, I'm not saying you don't kick the tires, you don't entertain this, but part of me sits back and go goes, "This is great, Madden. This is great hypothetically, but the actual production, for the most part, hasn't really been there." That said, he's kind of been stuck in a barren wasteland of football between the Arizona Cardinals and the New York football giants, it's been pretty rough. I, I can't say that he's been utilized properly. I'm sort of envisioning a souped up Daniel Sorensen role because he's, he's pretty good in coverage. Uh, now, now he's not as good against the run, but yeah. I'll give you some numbers. Actually, I, this is to actually help you out here. His PFF coverage grade is eighty-two point seven. His pass rush grade is forty-four point one. His run defense is fifty-four point seven. Uh, overall, he graded out as a sixty-eight point nine. Um, he actually had the majority of his snaps in coverage: two hundred and three coverage snaps, uh, eighty-four run defense, and ninety-one pass rush. So again, he is used all over the uh, all over the field. And it's kind of hard to grade him because he hasn't been utilized in one fashion or one role, even if it's a hybrid role long enough. I, I kind of picture similar to what happened with Alex Smith when he had all these different coordinators and he couldn't just settle down and get used to one role in one system. I think that's the case here. But if you look at the traits, 6'4", 238, runs a 43940, has a 39-inch vertical, just an absolute monster, the former eighth pick overall. I mean, Veach has to be salivating over this guy at Spags as well, but we were just talking about Dave Tobe. If you want a guy that can chase down people on this, I would say, uh, more crucial 
hybrid kickoff uh, than the old kickoff situation. He seems kind of perfect there. Yeah, I feel like, you know, uh, Dave Tobe would love Isaiah Simmons there. You're right. It's so funny when you look back at his, his combine numbers and the scores and everything. His score breakdown on next-gen stats, production score 99, his athleticism score 99, his total score 99. It, it, it was, again, just an absurd prospect coming out of college. It's just where is his role? And I do think you're on to him because he's been with the, with the Giants and mm -hmm. with the Cardinals. But what I will say is the Giants actually had a decent defense. Like, I know it's fun to make fun of the Giants. I get it. But they had Wink Martindale, who's a very creative guy. He's a very well-known, well-respected defensive coordinator, although apparently him and Brian Dayball didn't always see uh, eye to eye. But I think you are right. If there was a DC to get the best out of him, it seemingly would be Steve Spagnuolo. Um Maybe even learning a little bit from Drew Tranquil. Yeah. Yeah, he loves versatility. I was kind of thinking, well, Willie Gay is gone, and they might need some help at safety. Eh. Inject this kind of freak of nature, and I think Spags will figure out how to use him. Touchdown, Kansas City! Number seven. We keep hearing that wide receiver is the weakest position on the Chiefs roster. But is this still true after the addition of Hollywood Brown? What do you think? No, good question. Weakest. Probably top down, yes. But part of me almost thinks defensive line still. Like, I get they brought they brought the gang back, but with Charles Minahu missing however long he's going to miss, the unknown of FAU, again, I'm pretty high on FAU, but I got to be realistic as well. I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's going to be a stud until we actually see some sort of semblance of that outside of one play. You know, he doesn't really have a um, a highlight reel. It's a highlight. That's what he has so far. You know, Carl Loftus is great and Chris Jones is great, but I'm not huge on Naughty, on Wharton. Um, they're fine. Playoff I Warren Sapp? I, 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 yeah, Mike Pinnell, I love in the playoffs. I don't, I, for a full season, I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, yeah, he's, he's duplicating that. I, you know me, I, I'm still pretty enamored and intrigued by a Tavondre sweat or a Fisk or, you know, if you want to even go, go edge and get, get, if Robinson falls from a zoo like that, would be very intriguing to me. Um, with wide receiver, you know, you have Hollywood Brown, you have, uh, Rasheed Rice. I think Rasheed Rice is, is, a top 32 wide receiver. I think Hollywood Brown's a top 45 wide receiver, probably. Um, you know, and you have the veteran Justin Watson, who's not great, but he's all reliable. They're going to draft a rookie. I think we all assume that. I, it, it's to, I go back and forth between defensive line and wide receiver for the weakest spot on the team. I'm going to throw a curveball at you, and I'm going to say offensive tackle because they don't have one proven, consistent offensive tackle who's done it in Kansas City uh, over an extended period of time. You can't say that, say that about Jawan Taylor or Wanya Morris. Donovan Smith is not on the roster. So I'm very concerned about this position. It helps that our quarterback, number 15, is a magician and has the best uh, pressure to sack rate in the NFL. I think he makes his tackles look a lot better because of that escapability, that pocket presence. He's very hard to bring down. He just has a preternatural feel for the game uh, that is rare. So I think maybe in a weird way, tackle in Kansas City isn't as important as it is in other places where quarterbacks can't get out of structure and don't have eyes in the back of their head. But it still worries me that we don't have one guy who has played a good, you know, a good complete season for the Kansas City Chiefs. We don't have that. So I think, again, in a strong offensive tackle draft class, they have to be looking at this position. I think it's fair. Um, I have said once, and I'll say it again, I'm fairly high on Wanya Morris taking the step forward, which it feels like I'm I'm on an island on this one. It's 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 Sterling's Island, and I'm looking around, and all of a sudden, all I see is is Wilson. I just see it. I just see a, um, a volleyball. the volleyball. Yeah. It's just me and the volleyball. No one no one's hanging out with me on Sterling Island because. I'm the only one that thinks uh, Wanya Morris is a uh, going to be a good left tackle, um, but it is what it is. I, I do think you're right. They do need some depth there. I think 
even just offensive line in totality. I mean, what are, what are your thoughts on Mike Caliendo? If he's going to be the guy that fills um, Nick Allegretti's spot, who at that point filled Andrew Wiley's spot, you know, they, they've been back filling the, because again, Wiley was a, a guard before he was a tackle, which is what he's now in, in Washington. So um I, I could entertain that. I don't think cornerbacks a massive need, even with the loss of Legarius. I have firm faith in Joshua Williams and Jalen Watson. No, they're not elite, but I think they're both solid. Um, and then Nazi Johnson, I think, throws the little wrench into that as well of where he fits. I think offensive line, defensive line, and wide receiver are your three options. Touchdown, Kansas City! One last note on this. I just think if you compare Hollywood Brown and Rashi Rice, who I think at this point are proven good NFL starters at wide receiver, if not stars, to Juwan Taylor and Wanya Morris, there's just no question who you feel better about. You swayed me, good sir. <laughs> That's what I'm here to do. Number eight, what position do you want the Chiefs to target in the first round of the NFL draft? Kind of a continuation of the last question. Best available. I'm going to be super lame. I'm sorry, everyone. I know how's that that fence post feel, but but hear me out for a second. I think majority of people want to see a wide receiver. Majority of people, or let's say 60% want to see a wide receiver, 25% want to see a tackle. Um, I don't know the other the other fifteen percent. I'm bad at defensive math. tackle. Maybe I'm, I'm, uh, I'm bad at math, but I, I I just want best available. I, I don't give a hoot who it is because the Chiefs brought in Hollywood Brown. That made me believe you don't have to draft a wide receiver in the first round. You bring this up all the time. The hit rates and bust rates for first round wide re wide receivers compared to second round. I mean, they're like the exact same. I mean, they're extremely similar. Yeah, especially if you cancel out the top ten and, and don't include those guys, it really is the same. Yeah, and so I'm sitting here going, you know, I don't mean to use another Mizzou player here, but just because he's projected to be a first-round player, a lot of people have first-round tab on him, and it's Rakestraw. I know you don't necessarily need a cornerback, but if a first-round talent falls to you, why wouldn't you? You always want to keep the cupboards full. You just got to take best player available. That's the way I view this. Obviously not, not running back and obviously not quarterback, but outside of those two positions, I don't care. You take BPA, best player available. That's the way I look at this. If it's if it's an edge rusher and you take three straight first round edge rushers, sign me up. By the way, the the past two years they've taken an edge rush in the first round, and what happened? They're holding Lombardi's baby again. That's not really scientific, but I think it's a valuable position. Well, if you keep taking bites at the apple, you're going to get some players, and if the Chiefs decide to go. Uh, receiver in the second round and edge in the first or defensive tackle in the first and keep loading up those units. I won't complain. I'm with you. I really like the depth at wide receiver in this class. And what scares me about taking a wide receiver there, once you get past Malik neighbors, Roma Dunze and Marvin Harrison jr. I don't see that big of a difference between wide receiver four and wide receiver 15. So it's scary to me to take a guy at 32 when I think the guy at 64 or maybe a little little trade up from 64 is going to be very similar. I mean, we saw this last year. The proof is in the pudding. Quentin Johnston, Rasheed Rice, very similar prospects. Who ended up being better? The guy in the second round. Now, that's not always the case, but we're seeing this more and more. We're seeing uh, a Tank Dell or a Puka Nakua, Rasheed Rice. Nico Collins. Right, right. So – I, I think tackle is really intriguing to me if certain guys fall. And I'm hoping a lot of quarterbacks, maybe even Bo Nix and Michael Penix go in the first round because that will push some guys with first round talent, first round grades. Because what, there's 20 guys usually in any given draft with actual first round grades. And the Chiefs are kind of outside that window. But with Trent McDuffie, they were able to go up and get one. And with George Karloftis, they thought another one fell to them. I don't think they felt that way about FAU necessarily, but maybe, maybe someone will slip. And that's my thought process as well. And that's why I said even cornerback with Ennis Rakestraw, because that's the name I have seen falling just a little bit. Again, it could be it could be anyone. We don't know their draft boards. Again, you're right. 16 to 18 to 20. Kool-Aid McKinstry or Cooper DeJean or whoever. 
It could, it could be anyone. I, I just want BPA. If you always draft the best player available, I think you're doing your, yourself and your team building a uh, a service. If you're always relying and pigeonholing yourself and having to take a certain position, I think you're doing yourself a disservice in the NFL. No one knows. Uh, I'm excited. This is going to be a fun draft for Kansas City. I hope they trade back. But if they couldn't trade back last year and a quarterback was still there, a team that, that, that hopefully wanted a fifth-year option didn't, good luck this year. Touchdown, Kansas City! Quick extra credit uh, question for you. Trading up, where are you at with trading up? Does it have to be somebody with superstar potential like offensive tackle Amarius Mims or tight end Brock Bowers for you yes. to think that's warranted? Yes. Yes. Thousand percent. So I, Xavier Worthy trading up four spots to get him. No, no. sir. Right. No, sir. I, 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 I just don't because then you're putting so much reliance. You're losing a pick somewhere and now you're putting reliance on that guy has to hit. And how often does that always hit? Again, I think Brett Veach has done a phenomenal job. Phenomenal job. But how many first rounders, second rounds have been just, oh yeah, dude. No, 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 no doubt about it. Yeah, McDuffie. Yeah, Carl Loftus, right? But how many have been second rounders to you know where she rise? McCall Harbin. He's fine. He's fine. Well, what about Brilliant Speaks? What about Sky? What about Sky? Like, like no, you, 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 you're then making that so reliant on that pick having to be a superstar. And sometimes, again, it works out like Trent McDuffie. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't want to take that risk time and time again. It's almost like you're playing roulette. And I don't want to play roulette. I, I want to have as many spins as possible. I don't want one spin to hit black. Give me three spins to land on black. Take the moonshot. If someone falls out of a range, they have no business, you know, falling out of a Brock Bowers and a Marius Mims. If you're looking at a guy that you think can be a five or six time first team all pro player, that might be worth it. They don't have a lot of picks this year, though. That is something to mention. Although I do think the extra third they have next year might be some additional ammo for them to move up this year. Steve's comments, electric dude. Please don't pronounce Cooper's name like he's from France ever again. Best, come on. Cooper DeJean. Cooper DeJean. Okay, DeJean. No, no, no. Cooper DeJean. Okay, okay, okay. I, I don't know how it's actually pronounced, but I'm going Cooper DeJean. That man wears man, Wranglers. I am. I am. That's wearing, Wranglers. You know, I am digesting as much college tape as I can and learning about these guys, but I do not really watch college football. So uh, particularly, I'm not going to sit around on a Saturday and watch America? an Iowa game. Wow. You, oh, Iowa? You're not going to watch I, the punt defense? You, you, you're you're, you, you're not going to sit at a bar and drink a, a beer for every point they score? Because let me tell you, sir, you are going home sober. You will find this out about – making choices about how many sports you can fit into your schedule when you're married. It's like, no, I don't hate America. I like being married. So you have to give some of them up. Mm. Tough, but fair. Mm -hmm. Where are we at? Uh, number number nine, right? I think no, we're, we're not at number 10. We're at number nine. Ah, yes. Who are a couple of your favorite current sleepers in the 2024 draft class? Yeah, I don't have a ton here. Um, Let's say outside the top fifty. Yeah, I, I got a couple of of small ones, and again, I'm I'm going more local here because it's it's players I watched um, a lot of, not just combine, but actual tape. And so I think it's more fair to give opinions on players that I've, you know, have a, a good viewpoint on. Uh, one Mizzou guy. Sorry, not trying to show my bias here, but again, I watched every single one of his games, and I will be the first to admit when I saw him start the year. I said, what, what are the Tigers doing? They have a better, more explosive player on this on this team. I thought Pete was going to be a better player than Cody Schrader. I'm an idiot. Co Cody Schrader perpetually outperforms what people think about him. Did it at D2, at Truman State, did it at Mizzou, it destroyed the SEC. And I know the combine numbers weren't great. Quite frankly, they were bad. Who cares? You have all this tape of him going against SEC talent and carrying the Missouri Tigers. Why does a 40 time matter that much? It's stupid. Like Cody Schrader is a guy who's a good pass catcher, a great hard runner, a willing pass protector, 
a guy you actually might want to use on the new special team, the new kickoffs, because he does have good vision and he always falls forward. I, I think Cody Schrader on day three is a really fun pick. Again, I don't like the Chiefs spending high value draft capital on a running back. But late round, getting a four years on a rookie deal for an RB. I mean, again, Pacheco's been injured. Who knows with McKinnon? He's perpetually injured, and he who knows if he's back or not. I, I'm not. He's fully, also ninety in running back years. I, I'm not fully believing in 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 um, you know generic Prince and and all that and Ceh. Uh, g- give me Cody Schrader round three, and then final guy Ben Sinnott, tight end from K State. Uh, I like him. I think he fooled everyone thinking that he was going to make a fullback type of guy because he wore number 34. Uh, dude, if you wore 88, that guy's like, oh yeah, he's a first rounder. But because he 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 put a fullback number on him and he, he was lined up in the backfield a lot, I, I think he'd be a good, fun player for the Chiefs. A good blocker, great pass catcher, unique, extremely athletic, has what, like a 40 inch vertical. He hit the, that, that tight end threshold height wise of, of, okay, he's, he, he just made the cutoff. I think Ben's in it from K-State's a real, uh, real fun one. Hmm. I'm with you on that. Cody Schrader, athleticism at running back matters a ton, I think. It doesn't matter as much at wide receiver, which is the first position I'm looking at for my sleeper. By the way, the best that- running back of all time was not known for athleticism. Stat-wise, Emmitt Smith. Well, he also ran behind maybe the best offensive line of all time. But – Look at Isaiah Pacheco. He fell to the seventh round because the production wasn't there. It wasn't sexy, but athletically, he was as good as anybody in his class. Uh, Jamari Thrash of Louisville, wide receiver, not an electric athlete, not a huge guy, but he falls into this archetype that I'm going to call slender separators. If you look at his relative athletic score, it is the exact same. It's eerie as Jaden Reed, a guy I was very high on last year, if you remember watching the show and us talking about wide receivers, he's that kind of guy. He He's very similar to Deontay Johnson on paper, to Stefan Diggs. The NFL sleeps on these guys every single year. Diggs was a fifth rounder. Deontay was a third rounder. Jaden Reed was the 50th pick overall. He didn't play like the 50th pick overall. So I think if you watch his tape, he just gets open at will, He's, he's a great technical route runner. I'm very excited about him. And I think he's going to be there maybe even in round three. I don't know if he'll be there at 95, but I think he'll be there probably at pick 70, pick 80. Touchdown, it's very Kansas City. We're going to take a little extra time on this one. Um, it's I've got one more sleeper. Demanding. It's very possible that the Chiefs could get a, a player like this in, in round three. I actually noticed my other sleeper watching Jamari Thrash. Because I only saw one cornerback stick with him. And I was like, who the hell is that? And it's quarterback Andrew Phillips of Kentucky. I've started to watch some of the cornerbacks. This guy is one of the spagsiest corners I've ever seen. He is a menace in the run game. He comes up and thumps people. It's really impressive. He's extremely physical, an extremely intense player. He's going to be able to press. He can play inside or out. He can play zone or man. He's great covering downfield. He's not afraid to challenge guys. He tracks the ball well. I mean, you watch his tape and you're like seeing some Trent McDuffie. You're seeing some Sneed. You're seeing some Charvarius Ward. Again, I think he's going to be a guy that's there around 70. Dane Brugler has him as the 69th ranked nice Nice. uh, uh, um, prospect in this class. So I'm very high on Andrew Phillips. Uh, Remember that name. Are you hiring him because he's ranked 69? It doesn't hurt, you know. I like Flapjack City. If you're cracking six foot, we ain't feeling you. That's kind of the Chiefs' motto at wide receiver. It's why Adam Best could not be a Chiefs wide receiver, and I could. Five uh, ten. The Chiefs surprisingly have not called me yet. Um, he also said, "I do want to see Sterling Patrick and everyone do a forty time challenge between one another. Is that is that Edward forty hands um, or a forty yard dash? Um, I think I'm winning both. By the way." against anyone in this uh podcast community yeah i'm i'm getting up there in age and the knees are pretty shot so i'm not winning maybe if there's a if we have a time machine and i can go back to when i was 18 maybe but you know i have uh 80 year old knees so i I would love love to do a combine an aa combine we would be uh be electric man it'd be fun number 10 let's finish this off 
How many Hawaiian shirts does Andy Reid have in his closet? I'm saying the over under is 50. Which one are you taking? Oh, realistically under, but uh, for the sake of fun, I'll go over. Uh, by the way, I watched him do a Guy Fieri um, little, little little cooking show. That dude is awesome. If Andy Reid, after the NFL, decides that he wants to get into a cooking show, I would watch every episode. I mean, he's so charismatic, so so good with the camera, so fun. Um Let's produce something. America's best burger. Andy Reid goes on the road and sits down with uh, football personalities in in cities across the country looking for the best burger in America. I mean, it's it's dude's good at that. Uh, Mm -hmm. But as far as the Hawaiian shirts go, yeah, he more than me. And I have a decent amount of Hawaiian shirts, but 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 more than me, me. too. Yeah, he doesn't seem like a materialistic guy. So on one hand, I'm thinking, ah. You know, how many can he really have? But he's also getting up there. He's like 65 years old and he's, he might not like flaunt it, but he's extremely, extremely wealthy. So I doubt he's, he's worrying about adding a couple Hawaiian shirts to his closet every year. I also think he's, uh, oh God, who's the, who's the minimalist closet person? I'm, I'm blanking on her name. I really doubt Andy Reid has time to like, like sift through his. Oh yeah, if it doesn't, if you don't have what's it, if you don't have feeling, let it go. Is that you? you know, I know what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. I don't think he's doing that. I don't think he's doing that. I think he's probably just keeping every Hawaiian shirt from his past. I, I think Andy's also kind of sentimental. You know, I wore this at the owners' meeting in in 2007, and that was you know this happened that year. So I'm going over, going over, strong. Strong. I love that our coach, when you see these pictures, it's like everyone else is going painfully neutral and just not trying to stand out. And they all kind of look like they came from uh, a laboratory that clones head coaches. And then you just have Andy Reid, kind of idiosyncratic, right in the middle. The first person you see uh, just, I, I don't know, he's just got such a unique Beautiful personality. I, I think uh, we're just so lucky, so blessed to have him. It's like 34 degrees, and he's rocking a Hawaiian shirt and Air Force Ones with shorts. I mean, it is just, it's a strong look. And by the way, I don't think we give Richard enough credit uh, for the countdown of Tron boob. Uh, I wonder why you put 8,008, you know, like on a calculator when you were in, in, in middle school because you thought it was absolutely hilarious. Uh, Richard, I appreciate you keeping that alive for us. It still is funny. It had been a while since we had Richard do that, but it's a fun thing we like to do. I like the the uh, the buzzer we have. It, it's got you know the Kansas City flavor. So uh, I think that's all we've got. You got any other thoughts? I'm done. Take us out, baby. Man, I'm I'm waiting for us to do something in free agency though. It's it's really killing me. But yeah, that's all we've got today. Props to our chat. We appreciate you guys for hanging out with us every Wednesday. If you haven't hit the like button yet or subscribed, please do that. AudioPod listeners, Spotify, Apple, please consider giving us a five-star review. That really helps us reach more listeners and allows AA to grow even faster. Join us next Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. Central here on the Arrowhead Attic channel. I think we're going to have some great guests this summer to talk draft. It's it's spring. It's not summer yet. Uh, Spring. I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to get to the three-peat, man. You know? Uh, give me some grace here. Enjoy the moment, my guy. Come on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're, what's the rush? You know, uh, appreciate these Super Bowls when you've got them. The only rush I want best is to listen to them. That's, that's sending us out. Go Chiefs.